Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center on a uh, sunny day, which I think is consistent with the optimism of the event we are sharing with you this morning. As I think you all know, we are here to talk about opportunities to strengthen small business and entrepreneurship in this country. The amount of rhetorical flourish for small business and entrepreneurship is probably unparalleled in our political discourse. But really, um, far too often, that enthusiasm does not, in fact, result in the kind of meaningful legislative activity necessary to make true on the expectation. And so what we are here to try to do is to stimulate both that discussion and create also the political momentum to engage these issues in a way that are going to lift up not only the broad U.S. economy, but millions of people along the way. As I think, again, you all recognize, small businesses are responsible for over half of all the private sector jobs in this country. But more than simply being the engines of the economy, small businesses are a source of personal independence, community stability. They nurture our creative expression. They enable our individual potential. And um, at a time of significant mistrust in almost all institutions, it's also worth noting that, according to the good people at Gallup, over two-thirds of the public have real confidence in small businesses as an American institution. And while they are clearly so vibrant to the fabric of our middle class, it is also important to realize that entrepreneurship has been in decline over the last several decades. And so we launched this task force over a year ago to try to develop and advocate for a set of what we believe are really pragmatic, specific ideas that will make the financial system work better for small businesses and all Americans. We set out to answer uh, four specific questions. What kinds of data will help policymakers, researchers, and lenders better understand small business financing, including potential inequities in the provision of small business credit? And how can that data be best collected and assessed? As you'll hear throughout the day, we have a quaint affinity for data and evidence at the BPC, and we felt that was the right place to enter the conversation. We also wanted to understand how financial regulations, especially those put into place following the 2000, 2007 and 8 crisis, impact small business lending, and is there room for improvement. We wanted to assess whether capital markets can better provide financing to small business. And then finally, how technology is changing the provision of credit to small businesses, and how can government respond to these changes. So that was the modest agenda that we have set out to engage. And um, I just really, before moving forward in the program, want to also help you understand why this issue is important to the BPC, because we are very engaged in this larger question of an opportunity agenda in this country. We are interested in what are programs that help people weather crises, what are programs that can help people build resilience in their own economy, and then also create opportunities for mobility. Um, the Treasury has uh, indicated that 40 percent of working adults believe that they could not get their hands on $400 without having to go to either a payday lender or sell a possession. So this means that millions of Americans are one busted radiator, broken ankle, tree on the roof away from their entire economic life unraveling. And so we're thinking about that in terms of what threats are in terms of the opioid crisis. We're looking at classic aspects of our opportunity infrastructure, education, early child care, workforce training, retirement security, access to capital is rarely understood as part of that larger agenda. For some reason, because it deals with banks, the kind of progressive imagination about how to lift people up kind of looks away and averts its eyes from those set of questions. Our view is that access to capital is fundamental to that opportunity agenda. And so, as I hope you'll hear today, we're making some really specific suggestions, but we really want you to understand that for us, this is part of a much broader story that we think is really the essential opportunity to strengthen the economy here over the years to come. So in a few minutes, we're going to bring up our, our task force to talk about the some 30 recommendations. Um, but before I do that, I have the great pleasure of introducing a real friend of BPC's, Anish Chopra. Anish has spent his career focused on the relationship between technology, economic opportunity, and community well-being. He served as the first secretary of technology for the state of Virginia, I'm sorry, the fourth Secretary of Technology of the State of Virginia, the first Chief Technology Officer of the United States, and is presently a healthcare entrepreneur who is trying to bring big data to promote value-based care. Anish is with us today to share his perspective on how we can use technology to unleash the promise and the potential 
across main streets in this country. Um, after that, we are going to have a chance for a panel discussion. We're going to have some conversation, um, and then hopefully leave you all inspired to work with us to uh, advance this agenda. So let us begin with uh, Anish. All right. Good morning. All right. Thank you, Jason. Obligatory. Give me that. Give me some love. There you go. This is awesome. Uh, I can't tell you. The timing of today's event is fascinating. Uh, while a little wonky, uh, for those of you who follow the news, uh, the Trump administration named uh, Kelvin Drogemeyer yesterday, yesterday to be the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And it is a statement that while uh, much of what happens in Washington is about the left and the right, uh, we're here at the Bipartisan Policy C uh, Center to say, as I will quote the Trump administration, uh, to advance a generational consensus that we should open up our government and harness the full power and potential of technology, data, and innovation to improve the lives of the American people. So uh, well-timed, Jason. I thought you knew that in advance. It's uh, maybe how that happened. Uh, but I'm really honored to be here and, of course, with so many old friends uh, to just share a little bit of context for, A, that generational consensus, what I believe that means in this era, and then, B, to give you a little bit of flavor of some of the opportunities that this incredible set of recommendations, by the way, pragmatic and implementable recommendations, uh, might mean for uh, the economy writ large and for, obviously, uh, main streets throughout the United States, especially in areas that have historically lacked uh, access to capital or have struggled, uh, whether it be through uh, issues of, of discrimination or other uh, macro factors. So a little bit of context. What is the framework for this notion of a generational consensus? It basically involves the following compact. One, that the public sector will do its part to invest in the enabling infrastructure for an innovation economy that historically had been roadways, railways, and runways, and now is increasingly digital, uh, but also research and development, human capital, talent. So there's a lot more raw material that we have to focus our time and attention. And I think you'll see a great deal of uh, bipartisanship around the need to make uh, said infrastructure investments. The second uh, does require a little bit of political uh, maneuvering, but there is this notion that we need to have fair and uh, focused rules to allow uh, marketplace dynamics, more competition, more uh, opportunity. And a great deal of the conversation in the report em emphasizes what we can do to uh, align the risks in society with the rules to honor and respect the challenges that are uh, very common on Main Street and may not be as uh, 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 widely understood perhaps on, on more traditional forms of, of Wall Street or, or central capital uh, centers. And then last but not least, and I think a message undergirding much of what you're hearing today, uh, the notion that in today's digital economy or tech-powered economy, we have opportunities for many more public, private, nonprofit collaborations for what many would call an all-hands-on-deck approach to really rally the, uh, uh, the entire community around ways to uh, boost economic uh, prospects in all, uh, in all parts of the country. So a word on each of these just to kind of plant the seeds for the discussion and then happily maybe a little bit of questioning and then we can dive into the panel. What are the enabling uh, infrastructure uh, elements? I do believe uh, this notion of open data as enabling infrastructure, it's section one of the report, uh, but it's critical because too many opinions are, are, are rendered on what it is that is ailing our, our Main Street uh, businesses, uh, but absent uh, evidence and the underlying uh, kind of evidence base that could base the conversation in something more useful, uh, we have a hard time. I will tell you, early in the Obama administration, one of the responsibilities in the Recovery Act was to better demonstrate that investments in research and development, particularly higher ed, would link to job creation throughout the economy. And just to give you a little window of some of the recommendations about how wonky it is, we went through a lot of hoops to do the following. Allow the IRS to open up tax records uh, de-identified for academics who received federal funding to be able to measure their economic impact, because many of them start companies. Uh, they don't, that's not necessarily known to the universities or they're not really well documented. So by being able to get an objective assessment about how investments in research led to actual company formation and then thereafter uh, all the jobs, 
That was an example of an open data set that had really been blocked from view, but because we pushed to make that uh, a possibility, information is now flowing uh, better, tightening up the linkage between R&D and, and economic growth. Uh, I think that same principle is what we're hearing uh, here. By the way, the Trump administration uh, has done its own version of this uh, among the sensitive data sets that are obviously protected under privacy rules are healthcare records. And uh, one of the most impressive aspects of the leadership in the Trump administration is that earlier this year at the Health Data Palooza, which is the open data jam uh, for how we uh, uh, open up more health information, uh, the administrator for CMS announced for the first time that uh, private sector health plans, Medicare Advantage plans, would have their underlying data systems open for researcher and innovator access. So not open for you and me to log in and pull people's medical records, but if you go through the security protocols and you make it in, it is now open. And just last week, uh, the first uh, wave of companies uh, that were allowed access to this information uh, started to mine it. And it's going to help us uncover what works and what doesn't in the healthcare delivery system. So um, a great deal of infrastructure uh, in the 21st century has a lot to do with the open data and its uh, re relevant uh, uses. By the way, why would this information be useful? Because of some of the underlying problems we read in the report. Our systems today don't do a great job rendering judgment on who does or does not get capital based on the true risk inherent in the business. We have too many blunt tools in place and that much of what this will do is potentially allow us to train uh, more sophisticated decision support tools uh, or artificial intelligence systems with the right guardrails uh, to open up more capital to places where it truly is deserved uh, while retaining some of the regulatory requirements in place. Point being, uh, we now have, I don't know, 30, NIH put 30,000 images, uh, radiology images out so that radiologists and their computer systems can understand how to detect those unique anomalies better. So decision support will improve. That's an example. On rules of the road, you know, one of the most important challenges of, we're going to get into that in detail, and I don't need to be the one to repeat a lot of this. Um, we, you know, I, I'm a Virginian, so we often joked, and I don't want to give credit wrongly, but just as a joke, Eric Cantor, Mark Warner, and Barack Obama walk into a bar, and out comes the Jobs Act. That was not exactly right, but, you know, the Virginia angle kind of makes that a fun story. The point being, uh, we clearly have had bipartisan commitment to deregulating. Uh, some of these financial services in pursuit of economic growth. More to be done, improvements on implementation, and a lot of that is carried in the recommendations. But I will make a comment, which again, not a lot of credit given to the Obama years, but I'll maybe say this is also bipartisan. Under Cass Sunstein's leadership, who ran regulatory reform, it had always been the case that small businesses were entitled to unique treatment on our regulatory frameworks. No new law was needed just exercising the muscles we had let atrophy over the years to study the impact of particular rules and regulations across any agency for impact on small business and the opportunity to offer regulatory alternatives to honor and respect them. Now, building on those legal authorities, uh, we could do smarter implementation of wire. Obviously, some of the recommendations here there are, are, all, are all possible. But I'll end with this last piece, which is the all hands on deck approach, because I do believe, uh, you know, this, whether it be the bipartisan act and the tax bill that covered the opportunity zones, which we're all kind of waiting to see, maybe to tweak and improve to make sure they can actually have the impact. But imagine what the all hands on deck uh, 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 strategy looks like. The Treasury Department publishes census tract level detail of every single opportunity zone in the country, public data. All of us can now see on a map, uh, economic developers can kind of figure, even though it's a federal program, you got state and local economic developers, you got the private sector, now there's a common language, and that may help to facilitate some of this. Um, the government spends a lot of money and issues grants. Uh, there's been a long-standing commitment to open up more and more of those resources to small business. One of the tools that we introduced, again, in a bipartisan way through the Competes Act, was the notion that we could replace 
boring government procurement with challenges, prizes, and competitions. So you don't have to have a PhD in government procurement to land the resources. You just know the problem that can be solved and you go after it. I can't tell you how many small businesses, uh, you know, will look at a challenge.gov could say, hey, I, I could do that for 30,000 bucks or 50,000 bucks. And problem solvers from completely different fields could bring their ideas to bear on issues where experts said, no, 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 only I know how to solve this. You got to give me my, my contract. And that's a wonderful opportunity. We could do more. Um, these are the opportunities where technology, data, and innovation can play a role. Let's get the infrastructure right. Let's apply the rules of the road in a manner that is focused on elevating the success of Main Street, emphasizing areas that have had historical underappreciation of capital, meaning uh, rural America and uh, communities of color, and then to all hands on deck approach, drive opportunities in those areas in a more uh, targeted and strategic way. Um, I am a disciple of the Steve Case, uh, th sort of uh, the new concept of the opportunity in the third wave of the internet. Um, here's how I think all of this comes together, and then my time will be up for our questions. I do imagine a world in Danville, Virginia, or Martinsville, Virginia, that have been massively hit by the uh, economic uh, downturn or the difficulty of global trade, specifically in textiles and in furniture. Um, I recall in, in visits to Danville, you know, we lost a lot of jobs in that, in that area. But they have talent and they understand what it would mean to build the furniture that you and I would love or to build the, the, the clothing that we would love, design the clothing we would love. Um, and in today's technology uh, and innovation era, those same individuals can now tap into 3D printing and modern design techniques and they can launch startups in pockets of the country where they have domain expertise. They don't have to get that PhD in router engineering but they simply know that their services are available that have been democratized thanks to broadband and infrastructure. And now they can take what they know in the domain and apply it in the, in, in the rest of the economy, solving it in Danville and Martinsville, but selling it literally everywhere. And that is, I think, the future. And if we can do this right, we can boost economic fortunes. So uh, when we look back at the records of who has the faith in the American dream, what percentage of people today believe they can do better than their parents or actually do, we'll start to see those numbers reverse. Thank you so very much for hearing me out. I think, uh, Jason, a couple minutes of questions, or uh, we'll dive into the panel. So uh, when you ask a question, if you can please first state who you are and who you're with. That would be helpful. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, John Brown. I'm an entrepreneur in Virginia. Good luck. Uh, thank you. Uh, you mentioned open data. Yes, sir. And that requires uh, development of technical standards. Yes, it does. But also the policies around who's allowed oh, to do what. Yes. My favorite part of the Dodd-Frank bill, but keep going. So what, what are the challenges on the policy front for information sharing and, and open data? Well, what needs uh, to happen? So, so this is a bedrock principle. I don't know who wrote the provision, but whoever did was brilliant, because I know these things are sort of mishmash of who did it. But in Dodd-Frank, um, there's instantiated, I think it's section 1033. I may get my section numbers wrong. Uh, it says the right is to the individual to connect their financial services information to an application of their choice. Let me clarify. Uh, this big fight, uh, FinTech, if you recall it, I don't mean to be casting blame or whatever, but let's just, if you, if you remember the storyline, um, one day JP Morgan Chase cut off access to mint.com, right, data sharing, and the premise was security, security, security. And by the way, I actually didn't disagree with that, meaning the way uh, Mint.com operated, you enter your username and password, and then this machine enters that username and password and screen scrapes the data. Not good technical approach and bad security. So uh, what we see in the user experience, it, it doesn't mean that the plumbing works on the back end. So they cut it off, it said security, we're cutting it off. Who has the rights to the data? The community went up in arms. And Richard Cordray picked up the phone and called Jamie Dimon and said, you know I have in Dodd-Frank rulemaking authority to explicitly mandate the banks open up the checking account data and financial data to any application of the consumer's choice, be it Mint or Schmint or Blint or whatever. And the response was brilliant. The industry reached consensus on a technical specification called OFX, the Open Financial Exchange. I think it's what it stands for, OFX. And now Mint.com is back in it with Chase 
using the proper security channels so that uh, the consumer is authorizing. I'm not giving my username and password to store on the Mint website. They're getting a token that is authorized by my allowing it on the Chase website. Well, anyway, it's complicated engineering. But the bottom line is that framework, it's the exact same technical framework that CMS has launched for something called the Blue Button API. So I can connect any app of my choice to my Medicare claims history. It's the same technical standards that um, states around the country are regulating utility companies to say that as we get that smart meter data, which is, gives me every seven minute, 15 minute increments of time, my energy usage, rather than wait for the end of the month of the bill to say, gee, I didn't know I could have saved 15%. Now I get that real time signal. Now I can connect my Nest to my smart meter. And this sounds very bourgeois Northern Virginia, so forgive me, but th these will democratize. <laughs> but the point is, uh, you can connect these digital assets and I control it. That's bedrock. It's bedrock in HIPAA, it's bedrock in Dodd-Frank. So now the question is, if that works, how do you build security frameworks on top of that bedrock principle? And that's now the issue of data sharing. I think of this era of consumer-directed exchange. Agency A and B will never agree to share. It's too annoying. And even if Senator Snow can like wave wands and beat people down on hearings, ain't gonna happen. Uh, she tries, right? You try? But, but you get the bedrock in to the consumer and that just liberates the data in a way uh, we, we haven't even yet imagined. Forgive me for that long answer to your question, but it is kind of an important one I missed. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marshall Borman. I head B2B sales for a startup here in Washington. Cool. And you were mentioning security frameworks. Yes, um, sir. NIST, cybersecurity yeah. frameworks. Seriously, right? Aside Boom, from, winning. Aside from Dodd-Frank, yes. what legislation is on the horizon to add on to those security frameworks? So here's the fascinating thing about NIST. NIST is like, it's bipartisan policy center for engineering. Everybody loves NIST. Who doesn't love NIST? Congress always says NIST will do it. My perception is we could certainly create new laws and Congress will constantly evaluate whether that's the case. But the beauty of what NIST has done is it's created essentially internet style regulation. So how does the internet regulate the internet? It's rough consensus running code. There isn't like an act of internet Congress that meets every 20 years to come update something. If there's a problem, they convene, Internet Engineering Task Force, they, they kind of move on it, people say who wants to solve it, they go. The NIST cybersecurity framework embodies the heart and soul of rough consensus running code, which means nothing stops it from evolving. You want to apply it in financial services? You don't have to wait for Congress to say that you have to. You can do it now because all the legal frameworks exist for voluntary industry adoption of standards. And oh, by the way, if you want to add regulatory dimensions, one could say uh, under the Federal Trade Commission, if you say as a business that you've adopted the NIST cybersecurity framework implementation version, da, 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 and you actually have not done so, you've lied to your customers subject to FTC regulation. So we've now created a beautiful flywheel of modernizing security regs to reflect the internet era. And uh, certainly Congress should oversee hearings and make sure we don't screw things up, but it is on a path every agency could benefit from. I'll give you a final comment about this. We created something called FedRAMP. So we wanted to use cloud infrastructure for government. If you remember, $80 billion government IT budget, 25% of that infrastructure, complete waste, fat, disgusting, vomit, I hate everything. And of course, we couldn't fix all that because it's too much bureaucratic nightmare. But what we decided to do is say, okay, we got to move to the cloud first. Uh, those standards were not in place for securing the cloud to meet kind of government requirements. So NIST helped sort out uh, technical standards. The uh, vendors voluntarily met the standard and now declare I've got FedRAMP certified products. The banking sector, I've been told, I can't say with quotes, basically said when we buy public cloud infrastructure, we buy the FedRAMP certified version because we know it's met the higher bar for security. So it's like a democratizing standards collaboration, upgrade the infrastructure and off we go. We have time for one more. All right, well thank you all very much. Well, you can all understand why we wanted Anish to get us going. His uh, combination of substance and exuberance is uh, really, I think, uh, 
at the highest levels of public service. Um, we want to get our panel to uh, now join us. Please, uh, I think JJ, we have you here. And while they are taking the stage, I just want to um, let you all know really what an incredible um, pleasure it's been to work with our four task force members. Uh, Anish talked about uh, Eric Cantor and President Obama and Mark Warner uh, entering a bar. Um, th does anyone know uh, what happens when a banker, a senator, an angel investor, and an SBA administrator <laughs> enter a bar? <laughs> I don't know either, but when they enter a think tank, it is pure deliberative magic. Um, this has been a project that has been marked by the kind of vigorous debate you would expect in an effort to really take a hard look at the last 10 years of post-crisis financial sector reform and its impact on small business. Um, but whereas Congress is always um, too often kind of caricatured by intransigence, um, this group has been caricatured by evidence and by a willingness to actually compromise while kind of abiding by their broader sense of purpose and principle. And it has been, um, in the best spirit of the BPC. And so I want to thank them. And I want to introduce our moderator, um, JJ Ramberg, who, uh, if you ever watch television and care about these issues, you probably think you're personal friends. Um, <laughs> but JJ is the host of MSNBC's Your Business, which is really the only television show that is dedicated to these kinds of issues and their effect on small business owners. She is also the co author of It's Your Business. 183 <laughs> essential tips that will transform your small business. Um, I got through the first 181, and then I, I then just took a nap. Um, <laughs> but she is also uh, an entrepreneur herself, having co-founded a, a business with her brother that is also, I think, quite impressive in that it returns a lot of the proceeds to um, charitable causes and communities. And so, JJ, no one better to lead this conversation than you, and I want to thank you and let you get started. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. And that was fantastic, Anish. Thank you. It was a great way to kick it off. And thank you all for inviting me. I'm going to just do a very quick, most people know who you are, but it, a quick intro to all of you so we know why you're sitting here. So Paul Gregg is the former chairman and CEO of First Merit Corporation, now the chair of Opus Bank, which focuses a lot on Main Street businesses that we're going to be talking about today. Senator Olympia Snow, former senator from Maine, who was the chair of the Small Business Committee, so right in my wheelhouse. Um, Karen Mills, the former administrator of the Small Business Administration, someone I turned to quite a bit during my time on television to find out what was going on. She also runs a private equity firm and is a fellow at Harvard Business School right now. Business School or just Harvard? Business School and the Kennedy School. And the Kennedy, oh gosh, okay. And then Mark Walsh, she's the CEO of Fact Squared, focused on machine learning and artificial intelligence, also an angel investor, a venture capitalist, and ran the SBIC and the SBI programs for Karen. All right, well thank you guys. We will kick this off. I want to start by just setting the stage. And Senator, I'll start with you on why does this matter? And Anish talked about it a little bit. We've all heard the statistics on small business powers the economy, but really in our general life, Google, Amazon, Facebook, they power our daily lives. Um, and more and more small businesses are leaving our, our main streets. And so, and our economy is doing quite well. And so why do, we, why do we care about getting more money to small businesses? Well, it's an excellent question and, and that's exactly why um, our task force was named the Main Street Finance Task Force to underscore the importance of the vitality of Main Streets across America. And so often the macroeconomic data has really masked the disparities and the unevenness regionally and geographically you know, about what's occurring in a lot of communities. So when you disaggregate the data, you know, either by types of businesses, you know, or who's, you know, benefiting and who isn't, uh, the, di the disparities become more obvious. Uh, and that was always one of my frustrations um, and being on the committee, both as chair and ranking member of the Senate Business Committee, the Senate Small Business Committee, and also when I served in the House, as well, I was on the House Small Business Committee because the state of Maine is a small business state, so it's a microcosm, you know, of the country and so many of the small communities. So when we say that small businesses, you know, are the lifeblood of our economy, that's uh, never been more true than today. 
and financing, the other dimension of what we're focusing on in the totality of our report is really the lifeblood to small businesses. So we need to focus, you know, as a country, both in Congress and with the President, you know, in, in viewing small businesses as a collective enterprise. You know, one big business, when you think about the 30 million small businesses plus across America, that can be the source of replenishment in these communities. They're the building blocks, and I think that that is often overlooked in terms of the value of small businesses. And it was always a source of my frustration because I don't think that in Congress they really appreciated, talked about it, but didn't do enough. And Karen, who's the small business administrator at the time, we used to share a lot of that frustration. I thought she was, you know, I said she was the one that knew how to create jobs in the White House, the one person who did because she had a hands-on experience. And the thing is, is that's why I did Main Street tours, to get the pulse of the community to understand what was going on, which I recommended to the President and other policy makers as well, because that's, that's the way you ascertain what is going on in the community. So that's really what has spurred us on, because uh, small businesses are going to be crucial to the future of this country. You're not going to have the mega enterprises like an Amazon. It's great that they can locate 50,000 jobs someplace, but that's not what this economy is going to be all about in the future. It's going to depend on on uh, small businesses. And if you look at the, you know, the numbers that were mentioned uh, previously about small businesses contribute to half you know, of all the private jobs in America, well, if that's the case in the past, imagine the future or two-thirds of the, almost two-thirds of all the net new jobs over the last 20 plus years. And we know credit and financing are key to what enables businesses to succeed and expand. Uh, Bank of America did a study and concluded that 38 percent of small businesses, uh, you know, rely on loans and gifts from family or friends, but most small businesses depend on banks and other external sources of credit in order to operate. And we know that the you know, financial crisis of 2008 really had a disproportionate impact on small businesses in terms of credit availability, uh, small business startups, and lending was slow to recover from that point forward, uh, and as we uh, certainly identified in our report. So when you think about lending to small businesses, it really became a tremendous challenge. Uh, to identify ways in which we could ultimately uh, bolster small businesses and help them. Uh, we identified, you know, for example, uh, businesses need, you know, $250,000 or less uh, in loans. That's sort of one of the, the, the points, um, the prime points for small businesses. And yet, uh, small businesses and local communities, women-owned or minority-owned enterprises, uh, in these communities have faced a particular challenge in accessing that size of a loan. And we know that $30,000 really is required of small businesses to start up, but they need ongoing financing to support their operations, their inventory if they want to expand, and of course uh, salaries. But on the other hand, uh, that is very difficult for them uh, to access. So as we look at our communities in Main Street, they are going to be the critical source you know, of support. The Main Street contributes to vibrancy, uh, the vitality and the cohesion of our communities. And so small businesses become the greatest economic growth uh, engine and also for equi uh, economic upward mobility. And yeah. it's the support of, of Main Street and middle class. Right, we've done a, a series on going around main st streets across America and it, it's devastating. It's devastating when the small businesses leave because it affects the entire community, right? Schools, education, crime, etc. And so if we can build up these main streets, it has a ripple effect across the community. So Paul, I want to ask you then because you're chair of a bank, you ran a bank for many years very successfully. For people who don't understand what it's like, I want to start my Main Street business or grow it. I go into a bank post-financial crisis, and I try and get a loan for $100,000. What is different today than 25 years ago? Well, there's a few things that are different. For starters, there's many fewer Main Street banks today than there were uh, pre-crisis. Uh, during the crisis, there's, there was a reduction of banks between zero and 100 million in assets. 100 million sounds like a lot, but in reality it's a pretty small bank. There was a 60 percent reduction in banks. So it's much more difficult for the owner of a business, an entrepreneur who has an idea, 
wants to expand a business, start a business, grow a business, to sit across from somebody who's a true decision maker. The branch of that bank may still be there, but it's typically run by somebody who doesn't have the authority to make a decision. So there's and no personal relationship the, anymore. The, the, uh, you're, you're lending by the numbers as opposed to character lending. Uh, when that Main Street Bank was there, uh, the president, CEO of that bank would typically know everybody in the community, know their character, may have known two generations of folks, and would make a, a, a character loan. Even if the numbers did not uh, justify the loan, uh, that loan would get made because they know it would kill that person if that business failed. Uh, they had uh, a, a confidence that that family would support the business and or the person would be successful. That type of character lending for the most part is gone. With the consolidation of branches and the consolidation of banks and many banks having left the economy, uh, there is uh, really lending by numbers and decisions are typically made at the home office which could be a thousand miles away. So it's much more difficult to have someone make a judgment and uh, rely on that judgment and, and make a loan or grant a loan. Uh, the other thing that is also uh, prevalent is that given the enormous increase in regulatory burden that came out of Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank was 2,300 pages of new rules and regulations, and Dodd-Frank mandated that the regulators uh, uh, write additional rules and regulations that ended up being 14,000 pages. So your Main Street Bank many of which are small businesses themselves. The median size of a bank in the country is 37 employees. All of a sudden, those banks are burdened with 16,300 pages of new regulation they have to comply with. Uh, there's tremendous cost infrastructure that gets added. So when you're looking at making a, call it a, uh, a $50,000 loan, and let's assume you're, you're, you're earning 5% over your cost of money, so pre-tax, you're making $2,500 a year on that loan. After tax, you're making $1,800, $1,900, but you're paying for your staff, for your branch, uh, for your compliance, for your risk management, for your audit team. You have a huge infrastructure that needs to get paid for with a nominal amount of money. So it's much more difficult for a bank to cost justify making smaller loans today than it was uh, pre the tremendous uh, regulation that occurred in the industry over the past eight years. So administrator, then is this a matter of let's lift some of those regulations and support small banks and then we'll get people to lend to Main Street businesses again? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank uh, the Bipartisan Policy Committee for just uh, bringing us all together and also issuing this report at such an important moment. Yesterday, uh, Treasury also issued a very long report on fintech and technology and how the game is going to change. And I think um, maybe Jason was prescient here, um, but we have an opportunity right now to do something that is transformative and to get behind um, a, a new way of thinking about access to capital for small businesses that takes into account that technology is really changing the game. So we have had, um, you know, the senator talked about how important small business is. And Paul talked about how difficult it is for the existing bank infrastructure that has so long been the partner of small business on Main Street. So what are we going to do now? And I think the answer is sort of a positive one, and it has, a, as Anish said, some danger, danger parts to it. One is that data transforms everything. And it's not just a case of, well, we're you know, the disruptors have shown up and fintech is going to take over and banks are dinosaurs. That's too simple a narrative. It turns out that the fintech disruptors, entrepreneurs, did show up when they saw banks being, you know, unable to make a profit, letting small businesses go. Happened a lot during the credit crisis when banks just uh, didn't have the capital. And at the SBA, we were able to help a lot of banks by doing a 90% guarantee. But it wasn't enough. There was this 30-year set of pressures on community banks. So what does technology bring? Technology brings something 
pretty special to the lender. There's sort of two problems in small business lending. Information opacity, which is the technical name for how in the heck are you going to know what's going on inside a small business, and are they really credit worthy? And heterogeneity, which is that all these small businesses are different, so once you get a formula for one kind of business, then the next person who comes in is completely different. So how do you solve that? And it turns out that the amount of data that is available and the way machines can learn on that data and the way you can get real-time data, like is the business paying their bills? Let's look at their actual cash through these APIs. Let's look at their bank accounts. You can get just better information. And when you do that, the idea is if you do it efficiently, you can make a $50,000 loan at a reasonable cost. On the small businesses side, imagine a world where a small business had transparency into their future cash flows. So you can see what I'm, I'm writing a book on fintech small business in the American dream, and we call this small business utopia. What if you actually knew when you were going to need extra cash flow and you could press a button and advance that money into your account by getting an invoice paid down immediately. You didn't have to wait for that customer and wonder if you're going to run out of money and go out of business. So we're at this moment of real transformation. What's the danger danger part? Well, the danger part is that um, Regulation in this country has not kept up. There are the Dodd-Frank issues that Paul described, but there's also seven regulators, um, who many of whom are here in this room, who do a terrific job, but there's overlapping purviews, and despite Senator Snow's efforts, we haven't <coughs> sorted out our spaghetti soup. How do we take this moment when the stars are kind of aligning? We've got like bipartisan <laughs> bills entering Congress. We have Treasury come up with a whole set of recommendations, very similar, and we did not arrange this, but there's a striking set of similarity in some of those recommendations to the bipartisan policy report. They just make sense. So I think the answer is not less regulation, more regulation. The question is smart regulation. And if we do this right, we create some of this infrastructure that Anish talks about that enables data and artificial intelligence to become a partner to financial services, we hope, for the benefit of banks, of platform companies like Amazon and others and Square who are going to be players. And at the same time, we protect the small business owner. One last point. The thing that worries me a lot is that all of the talk is about consumers in CFPB and many of the protections, and we leave out small business owners. We have no rules about transparency um, and disclosure on some of these loans for small business owners. That is worrisome because small business owners find it difficult to understand what it is they're getting into and they can be taken advantage of by bad actors. So if we create a regulatory environment that enables innovation but protects small business owners, that would be a promising step. So, Mark, can you paint a picture for me? You guys have, is it 20, it's 27 recommendations. Um, yep. All of them go through, everything's perfect, the, everything's enacted. What does it look like? I want to start a new store on Main Street. I need $150,000. What happens to me? Wow. Um, I have the <laughs> faintest idea, JJ. Uh, I think you've heard a version of what you're asking to be painted through the three responses so far. and. To some extent, as Anish teed up uh, the conversation today in, in, a, in a really great way, um, everything's getting faster, smarter, better. And what that typically implies, as was said about the word disruption, is that disruption tends to help make things faster, better, and smarter. But one key thing we might remember is that Darwin was right. But Darwin did not say that the strong survive. What Darwin said is the adaptable survive. So the picture I would paint is that in the future, or perhaps today and going forward, those elements of the access to capital that we take 
uh, that we take great pride in, they have traditional strength. As Paul mentioned, the traditional small bank in Danville, Virginia, or cities that Anish mentioned that are typically outside the mainstream of access to capital, like New York and Boston and the Bay Area, for instance, in my world of technology, that those elements of access to capital, of the application process, the recipient of capital, the small business, the, uh, the transparency or lack of opacity that that small business presents to the bank and to its vendors and to its customers when they look for more and more capital if they're successful in trying to grow. These are the kinds of disruptive factors that all of us saw between 1990 with you've got mail at AOL, my old employer, and today when we use the internet and those pathways as easily and simply and as robustly as we used electricity in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. So this level of access to capital, rather, rather access to information, usage of information in a fast, simple, and nimble way on both the source of capital and the consumer of capital in small businesses in zip codes that don't start with zero, one, and nine, those three cities I mentioned. This is the disruptive picture that I think you're starting to see all the participants that we talk to in this report and many of the recommendations in this report, and by the way, it makes a great gift, so I, I recommend that you share it with all, all your friends. But these are the types of recommendations that we're concluding. And my final point is, I think what has been stressed, but I think cannot be overstressed, is that there's some very, very good low-hanging fruit here. As the Senator and many in this room know, it is very hard to gain traction for things that are big plays. And I'm not saying that some of our, some of our recommendations are small plays, but they are small enough that many people on the Hill and many folks in this room and many lobbyists and many folks around in the state and even local level can find consensus and agreement on them and implement them rapidly. So one of the great things about our work together, which had its moments of, of, uh, of conversation and in some cases, you know, uh, conflict, which was great, but we did find that there's some big plays, there's some medium size, and there's some easily implementable smaller plays in our recommendations. And we certainly hope that conversations that come after today represent some of that traction and some of that growth. Like what? Tell, tell some of the low-hanging fruit. Well, I think there's an element in the IRS, and I mean no disrespect to the IRS, but there's some ways today that the IRS can present information on a small business's uh, IRS returns in the past that a bank can get more rapidly, more easily, and use more, more quickly. Today, when, they, when the bank or the source of capital asks the IRS for this, shockingly, it takes a little too long. The IRS has the data. There's some permission things they have to get through. Actually, it really touches on some of the things we heard earlier from Anish. If you flip a few switches and have some transparent uh, standard, standards, basically, for this kind of data, a bank, like Paul, when he was younger in his career and running a smaller bank or on his way up to being a big chieftain like, like he was, that man or woman can flick a few switches and get IRS data to validate the health, the strength, the nimbleness, and the future of that small business super rapidly. You take away a few of these, a few of these roadblocks, and you look at Paul's math about the profitability of a small loan, you take away some of those roadblocks, and as, and as uh, the administrator mentioned, it doesn't take a lot of roadblocks removal to make smaller loans more profitable for the source of capital. These are the types of smaller implement, implementable things that we're talking about. I, I want to stick with you for one last question, which is crowdfunding. Allowing equity crowdfunding was a big deal. Um, now, it's been around for a while. We've done quite a few stories on my show about it. Do you think, is it working, right? Are we, are we seeing the needle move because now we allow crowdfunding? Uh, this, my personal opinion is no, we have not seen the needle move yet. But I think any time you introduce a, north, a new source of capital to a new set of customers, you're gonna have a very, very slow curve, uh, adoption curve. You know, in the venture world, we're, we're always looking for the hockey stick growth, right? Gotta go up and bing, bing, Amazon, all of a sudden a gazillion dollar company. And, and uh, Jeff Bezos, who I met when he was selling books way, way back, by the way, uh, is now the richest man in America. So you look for that hockey stick, but I think the adoption of new tactics and, and, and pathways to capital is always a lot slower. A. B, the second point, and perhaps as important, is that uh, government regulators, and I just was with some SEC folks uh, last week, they tend to see the world through the prism of misbehavior as opposed to encouragement. So you sometimes see regulators, when they open a new access uh, source to capital, like we're talking about with, with uh, crowdfunding and, and small smaller IPOs, as they, as they are often called, uh, they're looking for the bad actors. And there are bad actors every single time. And sometimes that prism makes them uh, almost lock down vitality and growth 
no disrespect meant, but lock it down to try and stop bad actors as opposed to seeing how it grows rapidly and trying to gather data on how bad actors are using it and then try and fix it later. So the short answer, long answer to a short question, I haven't seen the vitality I was hoping to with these new sources, but I do believe that in the future it'll start to grow and with some good examples, it'll grow more rapidly. All sources of capital, you see venture, private equity, all the, when they start to get a little traction, then other folks start to pile in. So I think it'll be a little bit of some lemmings, uh, lemming motions going on. A few very successful small IPOs will have other companies and other startups try to use it. Um, one of the other points uh, in terms of what Congress could do uh, is for an example, um, an amendment that I pushed uh, during the Dodd form uh, debate uh, in the United States Senate, which was to apply the newly created at the time, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to be a covered agency under the Regulatory Flexibility Act, so it required them to set up review panels to evaluate the impact of regulations at the forefront of the regulatory process, not, you know, waiting until, you know, small businesses have to react to the consequences of the punitive and onerous, you know, regulations that are imposed on them. And so I think, so we recommend extending that requirement uh, to the FDIC, to the OCC, Federal Reserve, and the National Credit Union Administration. So they'd be required to set these review panels, consider the impact and the economic costs of, you know, credit uh, to small businesses before they promulgate these rules uh, and regulations. And these review panels have actually worked very well. And GAO did an analysis and said that by engaging groups early on, which is, you know, requires them to include in their panel uh, various stakeholders like, you know, obviously small businesses, but governmental, you know, agencies as well as nonprofits, by engaging them early on, it has resulted in, in a much improved decision making process and as, as a result, rules. It worked well. I think Anish, you mentioned that, is, uh, you know, in talking about agencies such as EPA and OSHA, uh, for example, you know, for 14 years at that point, it worked very well. But I can tell you, there was a big pushback. I had a mighty fight, uh, not only in the Senate, but throughout the conference, and ultimately pre prevailed, which was hard to understand because it was a relatively easy, straightforward approach, but then we're talking about Congress. Uh, it wasn't... Um, it was a major challenge. So, uh, you know, I still don't know today as to whether or not, you know, we'll have a major battle in that, in that regard. But I think that, uh, to Mark's point, is that we have to evaluate issues through the prism of small businesses on a variety of fronts. And I think that that's what this report you know, is all about. So I think the complicated part of this, and Administrator, I'll, I'll let you answer, is we use small business so widely, right? So my company, which is a, you know, was a fast-growing internet company, is a small business, as is the dry cleaner down the street. And so how do we parse it out in a way that is then not confusing to lawmakers, regulators, et cetera? So there is a big debate about whether small businesses actually matter to the economy. And Senator Snow made the case. Um, but one of the things we try to do in this report is separate out the different kinds of small businesses. If you look at the small businesses that maybe are going to use equity crowdfunding and um, that are going to go public, they are really important. They're high growth businesses. We do a lot of things across gov government to encourage their innovation. But today, we're actually not talking about them. We're talking today about Main Street small businesses. There are 44 million um, uh, of the people employed uh, of these Main Street small businesses, 4.4 million of them have employees. And I think they have 44 million um, of employment. So there are a huge amount of uh, the vitality of our neighborhoods. When you think about finance and trying to make sure there's access to capital, 75% of them want a loan under $250,000. So it just brings into focus the fact that this is a problem that we need to solve if we want to keep growing our economy and creating jobs. Now, there's a lot of people who say, well, they don't actually need capital. They don't need a bank. But 
what happens in these small businesses is they have 27 days worth of cash flow. They have no cash buffers. This is like the part Jason was talking about when people don't have $400. So they need some kind of credit in order to sustain themselves through the bumps that small businesses have. And by the way, small businesses also tend to not know when those cash bumps are coming. So we are now uh, kind of, I think, down in Main Street, in rural communities, in this part of the country that has suffered. They really suffered. We lost 1.8 million jobs in the first quarter that I was SBA administrator. And that was January, February, March 2009. Why? Because credit froze in this country. And banks stopped lending. And we had a big fight in the White House about um, whether or not small businesses were suffering. Why? Because we didn't have the data real time to know how bad it was. And um, luckily, we were able to, uh, was able to persuade at the top of my lungs a few folks that we should raise our guarantee rate at the SBA to 90%. But that was a pretty risky thing. I think if I hadn't been a venture capitalist, if I'd known, you know, I thought we were supposed to solve the problem. There was a crisis. But we were able to, thanks to Senator Snow and passing the Recovery Act, we were able to help millions of small businesses get access to credit. That is emblazoned in my mind because we are just, you know, one step away from other fiscal crises. And if we don't have ways to get access to capital to Main Street, we are going to really hurt people who had a very, very slow recovery. And I think innovation is going to be a positive, but if we don't get our regulation right, it also can provide a lot of bad actors. And you saw this in China, um, where there was a lot of fraud and a lot of people got taken advantage of. So this is um, important. This is core. And this is also something that is bipartisan. And that we know from our experience, we can uh, make a difference. Congress can make a difference. And um, this report, I think, can make a difference. Well, I think, let's, go ahead. Let, let's go back a second to the question you asked a few minutes ago about if, if you're trying to start a business with $150,000 on Main Street, what do you do? Um, to start any business, you need some capital. And capital for a small business owner typically comes from the built up equity in their home. They can tap that equity either through a new mortgage or through a home equity loan, uh, invest that money in a business, and a bank based on that investment and in capital will lend for the furniture, fixturing, telephone system, what have you, inventory, to start the store. Um, during the recession, yes, banks definitely pulled back, unquestionably, yet the source, the resource of home equity disappeared. Home prices throughout the country dropped 20, 25 percent almost overnight, and the ability to access that capital to start a new business uh, was no longer there. Uh, what is a little puzzling to me is now that home values have restored themselves in most parts of the country, we're still seeing a lackluster growth of small businesses, which would be a little bit of a logical disconnect. Uh, but to, to, to get that business started, uh, crowdfunding isn't going to help you, angel investors, venture capital, you're not going to get a venture capitalist interested in putting $30,000 in your store. You need capital. It's a fundamental building block of any company is to have that cushion, which is capital. And lenders on, will, will go on top of that capital and lend money for the assets you need to put together uh, to, to establish your business. The, the other question, I, I'm all for fintech. I'm all for this new uh, charter that the OCC is talking about uh, uh, yesterday, actually. Um, but that personal relationship that you have with the bank and the bank sitting there across from you and listening to your story and believing in your story and lending on it, I question whether that won't still exist 50 years from now or 100 years from now. 
because there's a judgment that needs to be made that cannot be made simply on an automated basis. It's a gut feel that that bank lender has uh, uh, the believability of the person on the other side of the desk. So that relationship, 99 plus percent of small business loans are made by the banking industry today. I question whether that's going to change dramatically in the future. You know, 99 percent, maybe 95 percent, but it's not going to be zero. Uh, and that personal relationship uh, that wasn't the point is that, important. That data can data can sit in the place of that, right? So right now, as Anish said, we're using blunt instruments, right, to, to do this kind of analysis. And now when you have so much data coming in, it actually makes the personal relationship a little less important? Uh, yet it is important because that person has to execute. People are that, chomping that at the person, bit <laughs> that, that person has to, has to be the one who is generating the cash flow in that business so, and, and, so, the, and the belief that that person is going to execute is very important. So since you're the one on the ground right now still lending to small businesses, what of your 27 recommendations is it will be have the most positive effect um, on your ability to lend to Main Street? I, I think certainly the recommendations, a set of recommendations that would tend to temper the cost, the regulatory compliance cost for the banking industry is going to encourage banks and give banks a resource and give banks a focus to lend more to small businesses. The bank I ran had 75,000 commercial customers, of which probably 72 or 73,000 were small businesses. So I am a big believer in the funding and financing of small businesses. Uh, and what I would love to see is that as this cost burden potentially can decline. And there's a number of things. Controller of the currency, Odding, came out with uh, some discussion on anti-money laundering uh, changes, uh, uh, community reinvestment, rethinking that act. Uh, creating some of the cost impediments to banks will encourage lending into uh, the small business So this is sort of community. a pre-financial crisis vision of, of what existed? I, I'm all for regulation. Mm -hmm. I think regulation in our industry is an important thing, uh, but there needs to be a balance that's struck. Uh, Over-regulation can be every bit as bad as lack of regulation. Right, of course. Administrator? Well, I'm, I'm going to make a prediction, um, which agrees with Paul in terms of the importance of relationship lending. So I'm writing a, this book, and this will be, uh, this is what I've been working on as part of it. But I think in the future, um, one of the winners is going to be a small business focused bank. And it really harkens back to what Paul described as this, you know, the initial old fashioned bank that knew you, that had this relationship. But in the future, one could imagine that it's technology enabled that it is focused. Maybe there are different small business banks in different verticals. Right now, small business gets the short shrift, and smaller businesses that want smaller loans get the very little crumbs at the end. So what if you have banks that are focused on that, that use technology to take out cost, but establish some of the relationships? It turns out that small businesses have an insatiable need for that conversation. Because they don't really know what's going on in their, in their business, and they don't have anybody to talk to about it. So very often in the past, they talked to their banker. And that's how they got good customer product fit. They got into a loan that was right for them, that was something they could handle and repay, which was good for them and good for the bank and the lender. How do we create that now? with technology to take out some of the costs, with the right regulatory framework, but that we don't lose that interaction that helps small businesses succeed. I think that happens in some version of an online bank, but that still has a place for that customer relationship. And, and let me add, the, the tailoring of a solution to a small business owner is probably the most important thing. It's more important than the rate that they pay. And let's give the, use the example again of, of this store. Uh, they have to buy a lot of fixed assets to open the store. The day that store opens, there's not a line of customers waiting to run in and, and buy merchandise. It takes a while to establish the business. And during that period of time, if you have the relationship that Karen just described, the lender can structure the loan such that you may not have to pay any principal for the first six months 
or you may not have to make any principal payments for the first year while that business is building up its cash flow. Uh, it's very hard to have that dialogue online. Uh, so that personal interaction, the customization, the tailoring of a loan solution to meet the needs of a borrower is something that the industry that I've been part of for 40 plus years uh, has always done and hopefully uh, will always do in the future. Uh, and the partnership with the fintech solutions, a number of large banks have made acquisitions of fintech companies uh, and their uh, enabling the quicker dissemination and, and transfer of information. All of that hopefully will lead to uh, a much improved uh, offering to small businesses and the encouragement of small businesses to not just start but also to be successful as they have a tailored uh, solution for their financing. All right, the red light is blinking on us, which means that I have to open it up to questions to all of you. Go ahead. Um, I think Jason commented in his opening. Hi, Shelley Porges, former uh, head of the Global Entrepreneurship Program at the U.S. State Department, Department serial entrepreneur and venture investor. Um, you, you, I think, Jason, you remarked in the beginning that our traditional ways of serving small businesses have often resulted in discrimination against certain communities, uh, people of color, women and other you know, special groups. And I wonder if you could comment on how technology will either hurt that or help that. Because on the one side, uh, you know, if we build on AI machine learning, which is building on history, which is building on the decision-making process we've always had, one could predict, potentially, that it could further hurt us. On the other side is this opportunity to take some of the personal elements out, which may have impinged on certain communities having access to capital. So could you comment on technology and what you're seeing, and especially as you're all on this leading edge of you know, actually lending, actually you know, you're in machine learning, I know you're writing your book. I, I'm very curious to see what you think the future will bring to, you know, w particularly with the application of technology in, in addressing some of these uh, inequ inequities. I'll start, and I think lots of people want to uh, chime in. We know that there's a, been an issue in the past um, with uneven access to capital for small business owners, particularly for women and minority-owned businesses. And one of the reasons we know is that um, the SBA portfolio is $100 billion of loans that would not be made without uh, some kind of credit support because banks felt they were too risky. Um, but they're good loans. They're 95% of those loans pay off. There's only a 5% loss rate. So how do you get $95 billion of good loans that the market won't make? And why are they over-indexed in women and minority-owned businesses? So we, feel, we can see that there is just something in the process that has friction. The market is, there's a market failure. It's not perfect. The concern is when you put the, these things, these lending algorithms uh, into the machine, that it's going to exacerbate the problem. And I think that this is an absolute valid concern. One, I'll offer one thing, and then I think the team has other ideas as well. The first thing do, you do is collect the data. And banks don't want to collect the data from Dodd-Frank because they were afraid they would get hit by disparate impact you know, regulation. And they said, well, wait a minute, we, didn't, you know, we weren't trying to discriminate. So we propose in this to collect the data in a third party, yeah. that we not use it for uh, punitive purposes. We use it to figure out how can we create more access? Where do we have problems? Where is the market failing? And when we do that, I think we're going to be able to make more positive progress. I'll, I'll, I'll hop in. You know, I, I'm swimming now in the deep waters of machine learning and AI, uh, two of the great oxymorons of all time. But I, I would just remind everybody that the A in AI stands for artificial, right? Um, and I think I would harken back to some of the things you've heard today from, from the team. Uh, relationships matter and big data is often uh, is often illustrative but it is not predictive and sometimes you hear tech gurus say in a perfect world in the future all these decisions will be clean and fast and fresh and wonderful well that's not the way the world works 
And in fact, it would work to your point, exactly at exacerbating the misallocation we see today of capital. So whether it's a new version of small bank, and I agree there'll be there'll be niche versions all, all over that maybe use you know Skype to have the personal relationship face to face that is gone from the world that Paul has described. But I think there will be ways. Good idea. Don't Good you think? Idea, yeah. I think there. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll patent it after we're finished here. Uh, I, I think there will be ways to gather data to show that in fact the misallocation of capital is based upon the addiction to profit that large banks have. Addiction that is fair, because it's a capitalist system. As you've heard the math, it's, uh, money is not scalable. A small loan doesn't make as much money as a big loan, so why would you make a smaller loan in a risky area geographically, a risky area demographically, and a risky gender area? You wouldn't. If you're a capitalist-run system where your shareholders expect higher EPS each quarter. This collision is what a lot of regulation is about, but I also think that there will be, to some extent with data, discovery of opportunities of industries and people and places. And he said it, Danville, Virginia, 3D printing of model pieces of furniture that they can have made offshore and bring back to Danville and sell on the web. That's going to happen. But there was a day when that kind of access to capital and the, and the, and the troubles that towns like Danville have experienced were, 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 were so crucial. I happen to believe, final point, and the time when I spent in the SBA, not, not under this administrator, and I wish I had, but the, the time I spent in the SBA, we saw, as was mentioned, that the government can be a guarantor and reducer of risk and an increase of appetite for risk for sources of capital like, 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 like banks. That works. But also the government can be a gatherer of data as to where the capital is going and to what kind of industries it's being allocated to. That's called industrial policy. Many nations on the planet have industrial policy. Our nation does not. I think pretty soon you'll start to see industrial policy as another component of allocating capital to places, to people, to industries and demographies that don't get it today because the math works. You heard the math, 95%. It works. And if it's a database business that we're in, the data will show that expanding access to capital to places and people that don't get it right now is overall a good strategy. You know, it'll be interesting to see five years from now. Um, competition in the lending industry is vicious today. And every banker is looking to make every loan that he or she can make. Uh, and it'll be very interesting to see if these competitive factors that have uh, become pronounced in the last four or five years uh, will, to a degree, solve the issue that is a real issue that you mentioned. Um, so, you know, time will tell the story there, but uh, competition always uh, can promote folks to do things they may not have done in the past, and, and uh, it'll be interesting to look backwards. Also, we recommend uh, reviewing the Community Reinvestment Act, you know, because uh, banks, you know, no longer depending on branches, so that's dictated by physical branch, uh, presence of banks in areas now with online lending. So to remove those, those barriers as well to look at, you know, where the capital can go that would benefit low and moderate income areas of the country. Um, Bryce, I'm with SW4 Insights, a public affairs advisory company. Um, I have a question for the. Thank you. I have a question for the panel about industrial loan companies and how you think that might play some role in increasing availability of capital to small businesses. Like, for example, I think in the news been reported, Square is exploring a plan to the FDIC to get an ILC charter. Do you think that might perhaps expand the pool of capital available? Because a company like Square or Amazon or whoever it is, you could argue they have insights too to the profile of the domestic borrower. They can see their business. They have a fuller picture that a community banker might have as well, and they might be able to play some role. Well, there's, um, we mentioned today in OCC charters. In, in the grand world of um, banking, there are seven regulators that affect uh, small business banking, but at the federal level, Nobody has the authority to grant a charter until recently. The OCC said, we think we've got that um, uh, authority. And uh, 
yesterday, uh, in the Treasury report issued yesterday, they reiterate that they think the OCC has that authority, and the OCC began yesterday accepting applications. So my guess is that that will be sort of the first arena for non-banks. Um, and the idea is to work through a uh, charter for a non-bank that the banks agree with, um, or that uh, that the industry, um, you know, uh, perceives as a balanced playing field. There's no question that Square is playing. There's no question that Amazon is playing. Amazon could play at 10 times, 10x where it is if it decides to tomorrow, and that raises in PayPal. Um, so the winners and losers are yet to be determined. One thing about Square and Amazon is that they're going to lend really well to their customers. If you don't do business with Square or Amazon because you have a different kind of business, you might want a different kind of lender. So my prediction is they will be critical. If you look at China, Ant Financial is a model that you might imagine happening. Um, but they aren't going to be the only way we solve the problem because we have a lot of entrepreneurs here who are going to find different ways. Yeah, so Karen looked at me, and um, I, I can only speak for myself, not for the industry overall, but I've always welcomed competition. Um, and as long as the playing field is level, as long as the new entrants have the same requirement for liquidity, the same requirement for capital, uh, have to uh, adhere to the same compliance laws that we have to adhere to, uh, have responsibility under the Community Reinvestment Act. If all of the requirements that we have are the same for the requirements of the uh, new, newly chartered uh, non-deposit-taking fintech company, uh, let's go at it. We'll compete. Here, in the five-year prediction uh, that we started here, here's mine. Here's a flash. Uh, five years from today, Amazon is the largest non-bank bank on the planet. To your point, Amazon knows more about its customers than anybody ever. A. B. It knows what sells and what doesn't. C. By knowing what sells, it can start competitors or fuel or fund competitors in sectors that they know customers are ready to buy stuff on Amazon in ways that I think we haven't seen today. I'm not saying that they're a bad company. I'm suggesting that they have transparency unlike any platform we've ever experienced as consumers or as businesses. And lastly, I'll suggest this. You think food is the last place they're gonna go? No. I think you'll see Amazon as a vendor, as a supplier, as a bank, as an extender of credit, as a database uh, a, a, a provider and, and administrator for business success unlike anything we've ever seen in the venture, banking, or angel investment arena. All right, all the way in the back. So one of the things I've realized is a lot of VCs are investing more in medium-sized businesses or compared to small startups. So um, also, I was saying, like, why is it that VCs are investing more in medium-sized businesses, I guess, uh, 250 or more employees, that's what the definition is. Um, and also, I was wanted to ask you is, how would you differentiate between a startup and a small business? Uh, like, why is the definition so not, you know, like, uh, academically, like, defined? Like, why is it such a difference between those things, you know? I'll hop on the venture, if you don't mind, real, real quick. So the venture capital industry has become a barbell business. There are lots of small venture firms with 50 million, maybe 80 million, to invest, and then there's a bunch of huge firms with billions to invest. There used to be lots of firms in the middle that had 150 to 350 million dollars raised to hand out investments of maybe two to five to seven million dollars. And the reason it's now a barbell business is exactly the math that you heard earlier from Paul, which is the cost of making an investment if you're a venture capitalist is the same whether you write a check for a million dollars or 25 million dollars. So if you're New Enterprise Associates in Friendship Heights, Maryland, the largest venture capital firm in America, you're gonna write a check for $50 million in a de-risked environment for a company called Uber, as opposed to writing 10 checks for $5 million in the transportation industry. It's just the math. So the nimble, smaller funds can make small, small investments, 750,000, a million five, and hope they get an Uber someday, or a big fund can just write a check for Uber, no risk, right before the IPO, everybody's happy. 
I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that's how the economics of being a VC have driven to the two ends of the, of the, uh, of, of the barbell. Your second question I, I'll put out to the panel. About, uh, the second question was why is it so hard to define? Startup versus small business, I guess yeah, you said. What is, your, what is the difference between small business and startup? Like, because I know small business is like less than 250 employees. Then how do you define a startup? <laughs> okay, I'll do it. So there's <laughs> 30 million small businesses in the US. About 450,000 businesses start up every year. The 30 million small businesses, only about 6 million of them have employees. So the rest of them are sole proprietorships, single people, which is good because that's 24 million jobs. Um, and so the startups are businesses that are starting up. They could be venture backed. They could be just somebody going into business for themselves. And, and, and the big distinguishing between startup and medium sized business in my mind is history, years of operation and generating cash flow. A startup, you have no idea what the true outcome is going to be until you see it, until it occurs. Whereas if you have a medium-sized business that has five years under their belt, you have history, you have progress, you have cash flow, you have capital, uh, you, you can truly assess what the likelihood of, of uh, 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 profitability and success in the future will be. Whereas with a startup, there's a high delta between failure and even making it past a year. So we have uh, time for one quick last question with some quick answers in the pink tie. You've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. Scott Stewart with the Innovative Lending Platform Association. Uh, I really appreciated all the comments on, on capital access and credit access. Uh, our member companies are doing an awful lot of that. About a third of the dollars that we're lending go into low-income zip codes, so it's a, it's a positive story. My question for you is, is on disclosure uh, and transparency for the small business borrower. Uh, we are practitioners of the smart box, straightforward metrics around rate and total cost, uh, which is APR, uh, monthly total cost, cents on a dollar, and uh, uh, total cost of capital. And I wanted to see what your thoughts were about the smart box and whether you had any other disclosure mechanisms that you recommended as a group. Senator, I know you started talking about this earlier. Yes, and uh, we have, in, in the recommendations uh, we propose uh, directing the FTC for, you know, disclosure on non-bank, you know, loans. Uh, there was a difference of opinion of whether or not we should extend that d disclosure in smart box uh, to banks based on the data. And that's obviously something uh, that we will continue to, to evaluate. But it is important in terms of having disclosure, as you know, under the Truth and Lending Act, it does require that type of disclosure for consumers. The question is whether or not to apply it to non-banks as well as banks. So we did uh, propose doing it for non-banks. And, uh, and so obviously uh, it's a question of whether or not to extend it. We did not require it for, for banks because we didn't feel like we had enough data, but there was, you know, difference of opinion. I think Karen felt that we have enough data uh, in order to go forward. But in any event, I mean, I think that is something uh, that we obviously should continue to look at on that yeah. basis. K Karen had made a comment early on, and uh, I, I, I'm on the other side of the spectrum on that, uh, really from a couple perspectives. And one, I talked about relationship. If you, as a lender, have a good relationship with your borrower, you're not going to put something in front of them that's unclear, that's ambiguous, and worse yet, that could possibly be deceitful. You're going to put a straightforward document in front of your borrower. I actually looked at the small lending documents from several banks, and they were as clear as could be. Uh, you had the dollar amount to be lent, you had the maturity date of the loan, you had the interest rate, and you had the repayment terms all on the front page. Anybody that has eyes could pull the four numbers off the front page, <clears throat> and many of them were in bold font. So they really popped off the front page. Additional disclosure beyond that, to me, simply adds to the burden, uh, the cost burden of these small Main Street banks that have failed and, and have not continued in business over the years, is simply adding to the cumulative cost of regulation that I don't think there's a benefit to be garnered from it, the additional cost. And I think it's very plain, very clear, 
uh, uh, and, and literally any borrower, be it the most unsophisticated or with a modicum of sophistication, can look at the face of a note and, and those numbers pop off and they know exactly what they're getting into. So Is this just the good practice of those banks, though, or is that <coughs> regulated? Because uh, if it's not regulated, right, then you are a good bank, someone else well, might be a predatory lender. Well, you know, the, the fact of the industry is that there's less than a handful of IT providers that service the whole industry. And these IT providers all will be selling a loan module to the banking industry. So as I looked at several banks' loan forms, I, other than the name of the bank, I couldn't distinguish one from the next. They're all pretty much the same, uh, offering that same information and that same uh, clarity. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, and again, if it goes back to, to relationship, I'd stand, we had a little under 5,000 people, I'd stand up in front of large audiences talking about customers for life as my definition of a relationship. If you're screwing with your customer, if you're not offering a transparent, clear lending arrangement, you will not have a relationship for life. You'll have a very short-term relationship. The goal of the industry is not to fool the borrower, but rather have fair terms that the borrower understands it's good for the bank, good for the borrower, and, and certainly hope that the borrower succeeds. All right. Unfortunately, we have to end. Thank you all so much. I, I get a little taste of how fiery I bet some of these discussions got. <laughs> and, uh, JJ, if I can uh, add a, a couple of um, words just as we uh, let you back into your day jobs. First of all, I want to thank, of course, our panel and, uh, and JJ and our questioners for really giving you a sense of the kind of the vibrancy of this interaction. Also, um, you might imagine there were a few people not on stage who did 90% of the work. I'd like to uh, thank and acknowledge John Sarushian, Justin Chardon, and Dora Engel, who really have led this project and done a lot of the uh, <laughs> underlying analysis. Also, uh, Jim Savan and Greg Wilson, who have been our spiritual advisors on these issues for uh, many years. I saw Aaron Klein in the audience, who previously directed the work here and has been much of that inspiration. Also want to thank um, any of you and the dozens of folks who have contributed uh, to this effort. A number of people have appropriately asked, so what now? And those of you who are familiar with the uh, ethos of the Bipartisan Policy Center know that we don't write reports just to make ourselves feel smart or fancy. We actually try to change the world. And so we are very actively engaged with members of Congress, have been throughout this process. There is a real eagerness on this agenda, and so we have optimism there. We're working with the administration. In fact, our co-chairs are heading over to the FDIC later today. And again, this is an ecosystem, right? This is trying to broaden this agenda in a way that gives it the political force to really, I think, move forward. And so towards that end, we are getting outside of Washington. We have a Main Street Matters campaign that you will um, be hearing about. And I, I will just close by saying, in addition to the kind of intellectual commitment, we also have a bit of an emotional appreciation to these challenges. I run a bizarre small business. We produce products that we don't sell, and our process is designed to make sure that nobody really likes them. Um, <laughs> so we do not have um, the kind of capital engagement uh, with the banking system, but we understand the anxieties of lumpy financing and rising health care costs and trying to provide predictability to employees and customers. And so you know, my hope is that this keeps us connected to this debate in a way that allows us to really be an anchor for some of this discussion going forwards. Finally, um, we have scraped all your data, and so we will be in touch with you as we move forwards, and I thank you for uh, joining us today.